Nice to see everybody or many people here in person today. I want to thank you for coming. It's really been amazing all these months that we've done this virtually and now be able to do this in person. Um, and we're looking forward to those individuals that are also virtually. As life around the state begins, Dr. Weaver and I wanted to provide an update on the things that we, that where everything stands with the pandemic today. Our positivity rate, which had dropped to as low as 2.1% in late June, has crept back up and now stands at 3.2%. While we're incredibly grateful to see the number of new deaths remain at the lowest levels since early in the pandemic, we also have seen a slight uptick in hospitalizations. At the same time, we're we're seeing a significant increase in the variants of virus across the state. As you know, we send samples of some tests we collect to be se sequenced, which is the process by which we determine if a variant of the SARS-CoV-2 virus exists. The B117 variant or the alpha variant that originated in the United Kingdom remains the top variant detected to date. However, we have seen a significant increase in the Delta variant that originated in India. As you can see on these next two slides, proportionally, the Delta variant is now the one that we are seeing most frequently as we sequence sorry, um, <laughs> these uh, uh, tests. The Delta variant is the dark blue on this slide, and you can see that it represents the majority of the variants found in the samples that we are testing. This is important because these mutations of the virus have been shown to be more more infectious, more easily transmitted, and to potentially cause more severe illness than the original strain. Unfortunately, we've seen that play out in several long-term care facilities recently. We have four facilities across the state. These are located in Howard, Fulton, Allen, and Gibson counties. At least 27 cases have been identified at these four facilities since mid-June, and we're unfortunately aware of at least seven deaths across the four facilities. All of those have occurred among residents. Most of the cases and deaths at these facilities have occurred among individuals who were unvaccinated or only partially vaccinated. These cases and deaths will be added to our long-term care dashboard and are required to be reported to CMS. When we have an outbreak like this, We've asked that samples be taken for sequencing. We have determined that the B117 variant is present in the Howard County cases we are working on getting. The Indiana Department of Health is working with these facilities to ensure that appropriate infection control measures are in place, such as properly wearing PPE, cohorting residents and staff. We're also providing education about vaccine to encourage residents and staff who are not already vaccinated to do so. This protects both the individual and and the residents that they care for. Unfortunately, we do expect to continue to see outbreaks, especially in areas with low vaccination rates. Long-term care facilities are already mandated, mandated to report their percentage of residents and staff who are vaccinated to the CDC. Although it's somewhat difficult to find on CMS on their website, um, we are going to make that available on our website um, starting in just a few weeks. While the majority of cases at these facilities have occurred among unvaccinated individuals, we have seen several breakthrough cases. Overall, however, the number of breakthrough cases statewide remain, remains very small in comparison to the number of people who are fully vaccinated. We've seen just over 2,700 breakthrough cases among nearly 2.9 million fully vaccinated Hoosiers. In that same population, we have seen 130 two breakthrough cases that required hospitalizations and a total of 46 deaths. The median age of those deaths is 81 years age old and more than 91% have occurred in individuals over the age of 65. It's important to remember that very few vaccines are 100% effective at preventing symptomatic illness, but these data clearly show that the vaccines are extremely effective at preventing severe illness that can lead to hospitalization and death. In fact, the COVID-19 vaccines have been shown to be 92 to 94 percent effective at preventing these severe outcomes. I want to emphasize once again that COVID-19 vaccine is free to all Hoosiers, regardless of your insurance status. If you do have insurance, the clinic, clinics collect that information so that they can charge your insurance company a small fee you will not be billed for any remaining cost. Some people People have suggested that because the vaccine order has my name on it, that I or the State Department of Health will profit from the vaccine 
vaccines and those administrative fees. That's absolutely false. Early in our vaccination efforts, I issued a statewide standing order that allows our clinics to administer the COVID-19 vaccine. And this includes pharmacies, FQHCs, mobile clinics, and other approved entities to administer the vaccine under my medical license and authority as a state health commissioner. The Indiana Department of Health collects the administrative fee received from insurance reimbursement. We then grant this fee back to the providers who administered the vaccine to help offset some of their costs. For vaccinations conducted by our department directly, the fees collected are used to offset expenses related to vaccinations. The first payments to providers are forthcoming and are anticipated to total more than $14 million. By taking on this role at the state level, we are able to reduce the administrative burden for clinics so that they can focus on getting this life-saving vaccine into the arms of every Hoosier who is eligible. Finally, I'd like to share an update on our planning for the upcoming school year. Earlier this summer, we issued guidance for schools related to masking and other precautions. I want to emphasize that these are recommendations, and we are they are based on the CDC's recommendations at the time. The CDC is expected to release new guidance today, which I understand will be out about 11 o'clock this morning, and we'll update our recommendations accordingly. However, remember that as of July 1st, Indiana communities and schools are authorized to determine how they want to handle the school year. We will continue to provide counties their metrics so that they can closely monitor changes in COVID-19 activity and take appropriate action. And we will departments as we navigate this next chapter of the pandemic. The CDC recommends wearing a mask if you're not immunized and are indoors around other people, especially if you're at high risk. We know that masks can provide protection based on what we've seen with other illnesses. As restrictions have eased and more Hoosiers have begun taking off their masks, we've seen an, a significant increase in cases of RSV, which is a respiratory illness that is common among children and especially more problematic for our newborn infants. This is not the time of year when we normally see these infections. It's a number of cases of summer colds after more than a year in which our staff was masked and stayed completely healthy and free of COVID-19 spread in our agency. So my advice to families is this, know your risks. If you're not vaccinated and if your child is not yet eligible to be vaccinated, wearing a mask when you're in congregate setting like school or other areas will help to provide protection. Keep washing your hands and do what you need to do to keep your family safe and related to our vaccination efforts. Thank you, Dr. Box. Today we celebrate the fact that nearly 2.9 million Hoosiers are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. That represents 49% of our eligible population age 12 years and older. Or older. In total, nearly 5.7 million doses have been administered across the state, and we are adding 8,000 to 10,000 additional doses in vaccine uptake, both by age and by geography. Less than half of Hoosiers age 40 to 49 have been vaccinated, and the percentages drop off significantly in younger age groups. About one third of people ages 16 to 29 have been vaccinated, while the number of fully vaccinated Hoosiers who are in the 12 to 15 year age group remains below 20%. This is concerning because of the increase in variants that Dr. Box mentioned. These variants have been shown to be more infectious and may cause more severe illness. And the vaccine is still the most effective tool that we have to protect the people we love. Many parents have expressed hesitation about vaccinating their children because of concerns about possible health effects such as myocarditis or pericarditis. These are conditions that occur when your body's immune system responds to an infection or some other tr trigger that causes inflammation of the heart. There have been reports of cases of these conditions in young people who have received the mRNA vaccines, which is the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. What I want to treatable and most patients fare very well. The risks associated with getting COVID-19 are higher than the risks of myocarditis or pericarditis. Based on hospitalization data collected over four months, we can predict that thousands of cases of COVID-19 have been prevented, while the number of cases of myocarditis remains low. This is true for both males and females, as you can see on the slide. As a parent, I will take those odds. As a physician, I will continue to urge any parent who has a child age 12 and older to consider getting their child vaccinated, especially before school starts. It provides protection.
protection to your child and to others. I do want to emphasize that a child must be 12 at the time of vaccination. Please be sure your child meets that minimum. We are making progress in increasing our vaccination numbers, but it really is one shot at a time most days. As you can see from the vaccine map, many areas of our state continue to have low rates rates of uptake. As the variants continue to increase, we need to keep working to change that map. We continue to take steps to try and increase interest and access. We are reaching out to counties to identify big summer festivals and other popular events so that we can offer mobile clinics at those locations. We have taken our mobile clinics to county fairs around the state, and our locations this week include Perry County Fair and Mosey Down Main Street in Lafayette. And next week, we'll be at fairs in Kosciuszko, Noble, Franklin, Gibson, and Tipton counties. We will offer free COVID-19 vaccines, along with $2,500 um, and other free health screenings at the Indiana Black and Minority Health Fair, which runs from July 16th to the 18th at the Indiana Convention Center. We are also partnering with IU Health to offer vaccines during the Indiana State Fair and the Brickyard 400. And we have worked to provide vaccines to primary care providers. So many of our primary care um, clinicians are now offering vaccine out of their clinic interest in testing and vaccination for the coming school year if parents give their consent. Some schools may want to handle this in-house, but we are also offering external resources to support schools who need help. Once we get those results, we will review them and determine how best we can help schools with testing and vaccination efforts. We really hope that schools will take us up on our offer to help. Many of our school-aged children are now eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. In addition, these clinics can provide an opportunity to catch up on routine childhood immunizations. We have seen a 20% decline in routine immunizations during the pandemic among younger children and an even higher decline among older children. This puts our youth at risk of becoming ill from a disease that is easily prevented by a vaccine. We all want this next school year to look more normal than it has in the last 16 months, but we also want schools to remember that COVID-19 is a communicable disease and that schools in our congregate settings where this virus can spread quickly among large groups of people. Because COVID-19 is a reportable disease, it must be reported to the state and local health department. All COVID cases must be investigated and we will continue to conduct contact tracing for positive cases. COVID-19 will still require schools to quarantine students who test positive and those close contacts who have been exposed if they aren't vaccinated. Fully vaccinated students will not need to quarantine unless they become symptomatic and then they should stay home and be tested. You would not let someone with measles or chickenpox continue to come to school and put others at risk. COVID-19 is the same situation and requires the same diligence. Finally, I want to remind you that the CDC recommends that you should be vaccinated even if you already had COVID-19. We do not yet know how long you are protected from getting sick again after recovering from COVID-19. It is possible, although rare, that you could be reinfected. Studies have shown that vaccination provides a strong boost in protection in people who have recovered from COVID-19, and your best protection comes from All right, our first question will be from Kristen at Fox 59. Good morning, thank you for taking our questions. Um, so surge specifically, if this surge continues, could there come a point where restrictions are going to be needed again to get cases back down? Well, I think that as we, if we start to see significant increases in cases, and we will see a surge of the Delta variant. It will be like other countries and other states that have seen this. Um, people will need to be very careful if they're unvaccinated and continue to wear their masks on a regular basis to protect themselves and their family. I think that we are not in planning any further restrictions at the state level, but individual communities and consultation schools in consultation with their local public health may decide to make different decisions based on the level of infection at that time. Just to follow up, you mentioned mask wearing. Could, or are, at this time, are you encouraging people to go back to wearing masks indoors, even if they're fully vaccinated? The only recommendation that I would have for that is I think if you're fully vaccinated, you're very protected if you're an otherwise healthy person. I think that if you are immunocompromised or otherwise maybe living with someone who's immunocompromised and could asymptomatically take back an infection, you might want to consider masking under those circumstances. Thank you. 
Our next question is from Steve with KPC Media. Good morning. How are you two doing today? <laughs> doing well. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry, I couldn't join you down in Indianapolis. It's a little bit of a drive uh, for us up here. Mm -hmm. uh, two quick questions. One, I was wondering if you believe there's um, some seasonality in play since we saw a serious drop in COVID during summer last year and numbers are real low now obviously vaccines play a part in that but I, I wanted to get your opinion on whether there's some seasonality at play um, and then second I also wanted to just touch base about geography looking at the zip code uh, map it's pretty clear to see that uh, urban suburban areas are more highly vaccinated while rural areas are much lower um, sometimes 10 percentage points plus behind the statewide average. So I wanted to uh, get some reasoning as to, to why um, you're seeing rural areas still continuing to lag in vaccination rate. I'll take that. Um, sure. Uh, well, to start with the seasonality, um, it's definitely something we're going to be paying attention to. I think it's still too early to tell exactly if there's seasonality to, um, to COVID majority of the reason why we've seen that drop is because of vaccines. Um, and now we're starting to see an increase with the Delta variant and people just moving about more often. So something just to watch in the coming months and time. Um, as far as geography, we agree. We're, we're doing a lot of work in our rural communities. We're working with our local health department, local providers, um, leaders. We, we've heard from people that they are, um, the people who have yet to been vaccinated are, are still concerned about safety. Um, you know, wanting to see more time or learn more. And they're very motivated by one-on-one -on -one conversations, whether that's with a peer or with their, with their primary care provider. So we do encourage people that if you have questions, or you have concerns, um, please, you know, take the time to talk to somebody care provider to get some more information about the vaccine. What else would you add to that? Yeah, I think that's the important thing that we've heard from a lot of rural areas when we've done surveys is they really want to hear from their primary care provider. Mm -hmm. And so we have done our very best to give toolkits to local providers to make sure that they have the information and the data at their fingertips to share um, with their patients and really encourage people. We, we know this is a difficult decision for some people because of their their fear of the of side effects of this. So we uh, want to encourage them to have those tough conversations. And as Lindsay and I say, it's just one person at a time right now. All right, next question from Nikki Kelly of the Journal Gazette. Hi, um, I have two quick questions. I wondered what you guys think about the idea of a booster. I know five, Pfizer is looking into whether a booster is needed, but the CDC and FDA came out today and said it's not at this time. And then secondly, on the masks in schools, can you just explain to me sort of why we're shifting all of a sudden from a state requirement for those 12 and under who can't be vaccinated to uh, school boards being in charge? They aren't the health officials and they feel like they're getting kind of caught in the crossfire with parents. I'll take the second one if you want to take the first one. Okay. Um, so as far as the boosters, I think we're going to continue to follow the data. We uh, understand from what we have right now that they're, the, the vaccines are holding up well. We're not seeing um, a significant increase in breakthrough cases that we would expect if there is really waning immunity. Um, but we're also following what's happening with the Delta variant and getting more information that's being reported out of different countries and, of course, will be reported across across different states. So we'll continue to follow what the CDC recommends um, and, and look to it, and we'll be ready. I mean, if, if it turns out that boosters are what's recommended and what's needed, whether it be for everybody or certain populations, we'll be ready to provide that. And I think when it comes to masks in schools, it, it, it's been, you know, we, we very much follow CDC guidance for our recommendations. And we say that if individuals are unvaccinated, they should, in indoor settings, wear a mask. Um, but as far as mandating that, with the difference in variability with the amount of disease that's present and in each individual's decisions, I hope that they make those decisions, the superintendents and the school boards, um, with the consultation of their local public health and their elected officials. I can tell you from having done this now for 15 or 16, however many months it's been, that people come down about half and half. If you, if you mandate mandate masks, 50% of people are angry. If you don't mandate masks, 50% of people are angry. And I understand. And I think no one should be criticized a child to school with masks if they have concerns, because we do know masks work to prevent the uh, increased spread of, of these viruses. Next question is from Rob Burgess. 
office of the Wabash Plain Dealer. I wanted to know about the uh, latest on the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, and specifically, I was wondering how these variants might play into that. I have not seen any data about the variants making a difference in the MISC. Lindsay, maybe you have read more um, about that. So, yes, not, not that I've seen where we, we, there's more cases of MISC, mm -hmm. but anytime there is an uptick in cases and we're worried, we're going, we're going to see more MISC, especially since our kids aren't, you know, up to 12 years old aren't able to be vaccinated yet. Um, but those 12 and older can get the vaccine and it does prevent um, MISC. MISC. Absolutely. Next question is from Rich Nye of WTHR. How do you guys feel we're doing compared to nationwide with our vaccine rate? And where would you like to get in terms of a percentage with any kind of, you know, in two months, three months, two weeks, whatever you would like to define that as? So obviously we're disappointed. We would rather be higher with our percentage of fully vaccinated individuals. Um, we knew there would come a time when we would go from people, you know, very, very anxious to get the vaccine and are not having enough to a time when we were really working very hard to get that next individual to be vaccinated. Right now, I think that one of the barriers for people is that it's still under an emergency use authorization. And we hear regularly on our meetings with the CDC and the White House that really the FDA needs to move. And if they have enough data, which this is by far the most studied vaccine in the history of the world, basically also for all the adverse effects, it's been studied the most approve this and license this, then I think that will help us with some people. And with some people, it's just a matter of time. And so we're, we're trying to be patient and continuing to give information and data as it comes out um, to continue to support education around this. And could a high school under any circumstance require the COVID-19 vaccine since those students would be eligible? We won't be requiring that at the state level. I think that individual schools would have to take that up with their local county officials. Next question is from Kathy at the Ferdinand News. Hello. Hi, How are you both today? Good. <laughs> just, a, just a quick question. Where, where does it stand with vaccinating under 12? I, I'm sure studies are being done. Is there a projection of when that will be available. So studies are still ongoing right now, um, specifically with the, with the Pfizer vaccine, it seems to be further along and will be the first likely to go after an FDA uh, emergency use authorization for under 12. We are still looking at the fall. We are hoping for early fall, but it may actually be, be, be later. Mm -hmm. So again, but we'll, we'll be- The estimate we heard was September to December. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see. Thank you. Next question from Nikki at WRTV. Good morning. 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 Um, so two quick questions. When we talk about reaching herd immunity, what happens if we never reach that point? I know you mentioned it's getting harder and harder to get people vaccinated to sign up to get that vaccine. What happens? When do we cut the cord and say, we're, we're done trying to do this? And then a follow-up quick question, if you don't mind, for parents under 12, uh, what's your message to them? There are plenty that are worried about sending their kids back to school. They can't get vaccinated there. So you know, herd immunity is a very nebulous thing. And, and a big part of that is how many people have been infected. And as you know, we had a lot of asymptomatic infections. So it's a very difficult thing to kind of pin down how many people have actually had the infection. And as Dr the biggest concern that we have. We know if people that have been infected before get immunized that their antibody rates go up significantly, like 100 times, which is a really good result with that. So we continue to encourage people, even if you've been infected, to get vaccinated. I don't think it's the State Department of Health we're ever going to give up encouraging people to get vaccinations against diseases that we know we can prevent disease and we can prevent hospitalizations and death. So just like influenza, just like measles, varicella, we will continue to recommend and encourage individuals to get vaccinated. The other one, um, with regards to schools, uh, you know, and masking, 
obviously by the time we go back, our junior high and high school students will have had enough time to be fully vaccinated if they want to be fully vaccinated. And so um, I feel more comfort there. I think it's the elementary kids that we have really no idea when they're going to actually be able to get immunized um, that is more concerning for me. And I know that that's a difficult decision um, for parents about what to do. We're hoping that parents will weigh in in the local community level um, to, to help the community um, make decisions. You can come back, come back um, unmasked. You can still wear your mask to school. I've seen many families out and about where the young um, kids are masked and mom and dad are not. And I think that's because they want to continue to protect them from the spread of this virus. Thank you. Next question is from Samantha at WLFI. Good morning. Thank you for taking our questions. When to vaccine hesitancy, there seems to be a lot of miseducation about the vaccine itself. Is the State Department of Health planning on doing any type of educational campaigns or going out in communities to try to convince these people and educate them that this is what they need to do? So that, that's ongoing. Um, we do social media messaging on a, on a regular basis, like I said, working with local officials, um, local leaders leaders in the community. We really have heard from people in, in, in our research and we're going out and talking, you know, what 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 do you need to hear? Who do you want to hear it from? It really is more that individual conversation now. So it's not so much the mass messaging that's making a difference, um, but one-on-one -on -one conversations. We get really good stories from people convincing, you know, other people at a dinner party or a PTO event or whatever it may be, talking to the people on the, on the ball field um, in, in order to encourage them to get vaccinated and to seek, um, you know, reputable sources for information. Go to the CDC website, go to rshot.in.gov. We have lots of FAQs on there to answer any question you might have. And I will say in talking to people, there's lots of different reasons. So there's not really a kind of one message fits all. And I think what Lindsay's saying is true. It's a person by person thing and we can all be vaccine ambassadors by educating you can say there's never been a history, you know, of a vaccine causing infertility, nor is there any evidence to base that on with regards to the COVID-19 vaccine. So just educating yourself and being that, that ambassador yourself is probably the most important thing to happen. Next question is from Abdul Hakim Shabazz of Indy Politics. Good to see you guys in person without wearing masks or anything. <laughs> uh, just real quickly, uh, how do you convince uh, people to you know, get vaccinated when they say no, the death rate isn't really all that bad. It's like you know, it's got a 99% uh, survival rate. They don't believe Dr. Fauci. Just how do you convince the people who are just hard-headed and don't want to listen to get vaccinated? That's a that's a really difficult question. I, I mean, I think you can do your best to educate them. I think it's probably more important that you listen to them. What what is their thought process? on that and then share with them how many people truly have died in the state of Indiana and how many more deaths we did have in 2020 as opposed to 2019 or 2017. Um, and then making sure that you, you can, you know, not be judgmental of them. I think that's the hard part is I think people feel feel uh, stigma if they get vac vaccinated in some areas of our state and stigma if they don't get vaccinated in some areas. And the important thing is that this is a healthcare decision each one of us has to make. But unfortunately, some people only learn when there is someone who becomes very, very ill close to them or dies from it. And then I think it may change their, their opinion of that. Lindsay, you want to add to that? No, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's heartbreaking um, as a emergency medicine physician to take care of people who come in with COVID and are very sick. You know, I kind of wish that people had the opportunity to sell, to tell that story because, you know, nobody thinks it's going to be them until it's them or their loved one um, until it's their loved one. In medicine, we always say, you know, it's a statistic until it's someone you love or yourself and then it's 100%. If you're the person who has the rare complication with the vaccine or you're the person that decides not to get it and gets COVID and has long-term adverse effects from it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question, Whitney Downard, CNHI. In a shocking twist of events, I have some questions about the long-term care facilities. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I actually wanted to know, you know, those breakthrough cases are much more likely to happen in that congregate elderly setting. A lot of them are immunocompromised. 
compromised? Are we doing more precautions there, you know, since breakthrough cases? Cases are more likely to happen there. You know, staff is not willing to get vaccinated, according to the latest numbers from the American Healthcare Association. What more precautions are we taking at the long-term care facilities? Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're, we're continuing to take precautions in the facility with our healthcare providers. Are continuing to wear mass when they are um, you know, working with residents. Of course, we're still continuing to cohort, so if people do become COVID positive, separating them from other people, you know, sanitizing things. Things really haven't changed much in long-term care, I would say, other than we now have the opportunity to get people vaccinated, and we will continue to do work to get more, you know, staff and residents vaccinated in long-term care as well. And I think that uh, one of our biggest emphasis right now is to go in with the team after we've had our infection control people in there, our people helping them cohort, our people to do testing, to actually go in behind that and almost do kind of a town hall with the residents and staff that aren't vaccinated to kind of hear from them what are the barriers to getting vaccinated in your We help them to understand the importance, especially in their, in their particular residents, um, the need to be vaccinated. And so to follow up on that, specifically with staff, what are some of the things that you're hearing from them? They were among the first group to be eligible to get vaccinated, mm -hmm. and those rates are still not very high. Right, and um, particularly um, the concern is, of course, that they many people have other underlying health conditions, whether you're the resident there or the staff. And so if you look at most of these infections, it comes in from the outside, right? It's someone who either comes to visit, although that is extremely rare or more likely a staff person um, that brings it in. So we would just want to work with them one-on-one -on -one to talk about what are their risk factors individually and really what is their obligation to the residents that they serve every day to help protect them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next up is Brandon Smith from Indiana Public Broadcasting. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is a, perhaps a version of the question that's been asked before, but if we can't get our vaccination numbers sort of up from where they've stalled out, are we just going to be stuck in these cycles where we get the numbers down, but then a variant comes around and the numbers surge and we start to worry about precautions in long-term care facilities? Are we just stuck in this cycle? Well, we, eventually the, vi the virus will have been around in some form long enough that we will have some underlying immunity, whether that's from vaccine or having been infected ourselves, which will help. But just like with influenza, there will be new strains that come along that we go, oh my gosh, it's the H1N1 strain this year, and we've got to, hopefully the vaccines are covering that strain. And so we're working to get everybody immunized. It'll probably become endemic and wax and wane, but, but what we'll see is outbreaks in areas that are, are have lower incidence of vaccination. Yeah, I would of unvaccinated areas where we're going to have outbreaks and, and we'll need to respond. But as long as the virus is around and spreading, then that increased the risk for different variants. And then I had a follow-up about uh, mask wearing, which was um, last year we heard a lot about you need to wear a mask to protect other people. And now it seems, if we're talking about fully vaccinated people not wearing them, not needing to wear them unless they're immunocompromised as opposed to the unvaccinated, is it's become more about protecting yourself. So is there still a concern that fully vaccinated people can spread the disease even if they don't realize they have it or are showing symptoms? We believe that that risk is very, very low. There's no evidence to show, even though a, a person who's been fully vaccinated tests positive, that their virus is replicating enough to infect another person. So it, minus being an immunocompromised person, that, that would not be very common for that to happen. Next question is Sherry from the Indy Star. Hi, I have two very unrelated questions, but the first is a uh, year ago, you guys signed a contract with Maximus to do contact tracing. Are they still doing contact tracing for the state as we go into kind of this more fallow area of the virus? And so how many contact tracers do you have? And if not, who is, who is in charge of the, the contact? contact tracing. And then the other question is, are you doing anything looking at long COVID um, and people who are suffering persistent symptoms after the acute infection passes? I'll let you take the second one. Okay. Um, we are still doing contact tracing, but we're in the process of transitioning contact tracing over from 
contacting every single person. We still send out a text message to every positive case, um, ask them um, to basically identify their close contacts and to notify them those individuals give them the education and information um, on that text that they can refer to. But large settings like large industries that have outbreaks, schools, um, long-term care facilities, hospitals. And we continue, when we're talking about mass early, to, to when you're working with at-risk population like hospitalized patients or long-term care facilities, you need to be masked as a healthcare provider to support that. So as a state, we're not specifically doing any research about long COVID, but are monitoring what we're hearing and the data from the research that's going on across the world about it. Thank you. And our final question is from Eric Berman of WIBC. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Good morning. A um, couple of questions following up on some things from earlier. Um, a question that I keep getting, and Dr. Weaver, you alluded to, is in, with regard to the Delta variant, you said that we know it's more infectious and it may be more severe. Can you expand on the state of the data right now in terms of whether it is or isn't more severe? Um, so it really depends on which um, data you look at. So it does seem to be that it is more severe, but not enough where I, I can say definitively. But just in the fact that it's more infectious and it will infect more people, then we will see more cases of hospitalization and unfortunately death as the Delta variant starts to spread. And secondly, the last time we got together a few weeks back, we were working on getting the vaccine into local providers' offices and hoping to do that by the end of May. If that's happened, I've not seen an announcement on it. What's the status of that, and when do we hope to be able to accomplish that? So we do have vaccine in provider offices across the state right now. We work to break down how much um, vaccine actually goes out, which we found to be the big bar barrier for primary care providers having it. And so they're able to order it through the state and whatever um, amount of vaccine that, that makes sense for them. So it is out there. We add more people every single week, more providers. So I do encourage people who are waiting for their primary care provider um, or their pediatrician to have vaccine to go ahead and reach out and find out if they don't have it, when will they get it? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That concludes today's health briefing. Thank you so much.